Hey everybody, Jay Widener here for part two of the Great Lunar Debate with Art Bell and Stanton Friedman, where I get double teamed, but not really. Uh, coming in with the warrior spirit, I was able to quickly vanquish the two gentlemen in a nice way. And um, we became really good friends by the end of the conversation, which is what you're about to hear. Um, so I, again, want to thank Art Bell for having me on. And I want to thank Stanton Friedman for giving me a vigorous debate, although I think at a certain point he gave up debating me because I had a, an answer for every point. And he just began telling us old war stories about his career, which is fine. That's what old guys do. And I also want to point out they're both gone from us now, and that's kind of weird and tragic. And uh, they were two great people. They were uh, helped uh, the field out a lot, and uh, it was an honor to uh, be in a debate conversation with them before both of them passed on. I'm Jay Widener, and please subscribe, uh, click like, um, comment, do whatever you can to help the channel. Tell your friends. Thanks. The subject would appear to be Philip Corso, and uh, and I'm good with that. I interviewed Philip Corso uh, actually in a series of the interviews, and boiled down his contention was we took the information from uh, the crash at Roswell and parceled it out to um, American industrial giants to build many of the things that we now enjoy. Uh, do both of you agree with that premise? I do. But that's what he claimed, yes. <laughs> okay, so that's not agreement. Um, you think that's exactly what he did. You believed Philip Cor Corzo J, correct? Yeah, I listened to your interviews all those years ago. Yeah, okay, all right. Well, Philip uh, <laughs> okay. um, Philip was uh, pretty convincing. Stanton, what do you have to say about him? Well, I did meet him more than once, uh, but I checked on him. Um and let me tell you some of the things I found. For one thing, he claimed uh, in the book The Day After Roswell that he had been a member of the National Security Council uh, under Eisenhower. Right. That's pretty high as far as advising to the president. You know, you don't sure. get any higher than the NSC. Uh, well, I checked with the Eisenhower Library. I've been there uh, many times, and they know me, so... Uh, I, I told them what he had claimed, and they checked, and I got a letter back uh, saying that uh, he not only was never a member of the NSC, but he never attended a meeting. They keep track of that sort of stuff. And uh, I sent a copy of the letter to the lawyer, Peter Gersten, to whom Philip had signed, for whom Phil had signed a sworn statement right. about his background. Right. And the lawyer showed it to Phil. Don't you think we should take that out? The, that claim? No. Uh, he, he didn't think so. Uh, he uh, a, a second example was that one of the things, remember that he wasn't saying that this was going on right after Roswell. Roswell happened in 47, early July. Uh, he was saying that this happened after he started to work for General Trudeau, mm -hmm. the Army Foreign Technology Division at the Pentagon, this is after 1960. So first of all, you have to think that, gee, what they, they left that wreckage lying around. He said he got a filing cabinet of uh, right. Roswell materials, and that was his job to parcel it out. Right. One, a couple of things that he took credit for. There are no references in the book, which I find very frustrating, of course, uh, were things. One, a guy got a Nobel Prize for work done years before Corso came along. Uh, that was clearly a lie, uh, to put it uh, bluntly. Uh, there were other things that we know the sequence of how those uh, new technologies came into being, lasers and other things. And of course, I wasn't part of it. Remember, he was not an engineer or a scientist. Uh, and so, uh, and remember that Strom Thurmond, who served, I still think he has the record for serving more years in the Senate than anybody, or close to it, if he's not, right. not still the record holder. Uh, he withdrew the forward that was used in the book because he thought it was for a different book <laughs> uh, about uh, in, intelligence agency work kind of stuff. And uh, when his people uh, found out what the book was about, uh, he withdrew it. So also he claimed that he 
uh, in July 6th, on July 6th, at Fort Riley, Kansas, uh, his bowling buddy let him look into this crate, which there was a blue liquid in which there was an alien body. Now, I, I've heard some egregious violations of security, but that outdoes them all. There is no way that's going to happen. That's like saying you're driving around with nuclear weapons in the truck and you park outside a McDonald's and leave the truck out. Okay, but you, you cannot uh, prove that did not happen. Uh, the other stuff, I guess, well, if you, if I you can... The, the dates are wrong. The dates are wrong. Uh, we know the date when Rancher Brazel came into Roswell. Right. And that was the sixth. And we also know that if there's one thing the 509th had at Roswell... The 509th Bomb Group. Yes. They're the guys who dropped the atomic bombs. Yes. You know, uh, if there, there's one thing they had was airplanes. Why would they put stuff on a truck? I mean, they put nuclear weapons on airplanes. They certainly trusted them enough to to be confident. That right. I'm that. just trying to make a distinction between what you have proven are lies and and what you speculate just couldn't be. Uh, but if you can prove well, one lie or two lies, then you can, then you can call it all into question. That I agree with. I I we we did a radio program. Uh, you know about radio programs. I'm here, a little, he's there, and they host is someplace else. Yes, yes, just like now. <laughs> uh, and I asked how he knew the date of July sixth. I asked, did you have a diary or a notebook? I was hoping he had something like that because that would be great. Well, I know when I was transferred there, it turns out that was in March or April. Uh, the date makes no sense. And uh, like I say, I worked under security for 14 years. And the idea of a bowling buddy uh, in the military letting you look in a, a crate that has an alien body in it uh, that is sitting around unguarded, it just it doesn't make any sense to me. Okay. All right. Uh, but, at but, all. But, but in terms of flat out lies... His work with the government that you documented, that that one does seem to be simply untrue. Jay, um, any comments? Well, no, actually, it doesn't surprise me that um, he, he's caught fibbing a couple times. I read the book, and I wondered it sometimes when I was reading it whether it was all the truth or not. But I just want to get <laughs> yeah. one thing clear here. You're saying that there's not really been much back engineering of anything, that that, that all those statements are Well, no, 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 no. He was saying Philip Corso didn't tell the truth. Now, look, if somebody lies, I'm sorry, but if I was an attorney and I was in court... I would have the whole damn thing thrown out successfully if I proved he lied. Yep. I, I well, agree. there's another part of this, too. I, I started to say before about when I spoke to the uh, NASA people, uh, what I wanted to get at and didn't, my, my problem, uh, was that the shape of the command module, and like it came home to me when I got my hand on it, it's a round, blunt body. I always thought, most people thought, that a high-speed aircraft has to have a plane, no sharp wings, highly streamlined, you know, like the X-15 or something like that. And we wind up with a round, blunt body coming back at 25,000 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, I checked and found that we did do wind tunnel tests in 47 of round, blunt bodies. So I think some smart person said, hey, if these guys are able to go this fast uh, with something that looks like that, uh, maybe we ought to look into it. <laughs> uh, so I think, and there may be other subtle things, maybe not so subtle, that have been done, uh, you know, in the course of the Cold War that we learned from. Remember, I, I'm giving a, <laughs> as it happens, I'm giving a paper uh, Saturday <laughs> in Nova Scotia, Liverpool, Nova Scotia. Everybody's welcome. Uh, in which I talk about crash saucers. From Roswell to Shag Harbor, which is also in Nova Scotia, I talk about five different events, and who knows how many more there were. They got better at covering things up. So I'm not saying we haven't been stimulated to look at new directions, that we haven't directly learned specific things that could be of interest. I, I certainly hope we did. If you got that much wreckage, there ought to be people. I mean, I think that was one of the functions of Operation Majestic 12 is to coordinate the efforts that uh, how do we find out mm. useful stuff here? You know, That's you don't exactly parcel that out to 20 different places. So 
uh, and I've got a book, Top Secret Magic, that goes into that. And, you know, I don't know if we, uh, certainly, are, you and I never talked about this, I don't think, about General Carol Bolander. No. Uh, it's an incredible tale. Uh, he was an Air Force general, an engineer on a lunar excursion module. Uh, J Jay, bear with me. I said lunar excursion module. <laughs> and uh, he wrote, a, he was asked in 1969, after the Condon Committee people had recommended in early 69 uh, that Project Blue Book be closed. He was asked, had no previous connection with Blue Book, Air Force Project Blue Book, uh, what should we do about Project Blue Book? And he wrote a memo, which we didn't see until 10 years later, and I think then it was inadvertently released. Uh, on the surface, it didn't look spectacular until you looked at what it said inside. In the memo, he said, and his memo resulted in the closure of Project Blue Book at the end of the year. He said, reports of UFOs which could affect national security are made in accordance with JNAP, Joint Army Navy Air Force Publication 146, or Air Force Manual 55-11, and are not part of the Blue Book system. It's, that's an extraordinary statement. It is. It is. And two paragraphs later, he says, if we close Project Blue Book, the public won't have a place to report UFO sightings. However, as previously noted, Reports which could affect national security will continue to be investigated using the procedures established for that purpose. Mm -hmm. And yet the Air Force for umpteen years has been saying, Blue Book was it, that's it, no national security. No oh, I know. All right. Well, I, I decided I'd call, I'd try to talk to him. So I located him. Uh, it's easier to find uh, generals with unusual names than John Smith, for example. <laughs> and I talked to General Bolander, retired by this time. And I said, it sounds to me like you're saying that there are two separate communication channels here. One for reports that could affect national security. And I just heard one, I told him, uh, about a saucer going down the runway at a strategic air command base where nuclear weapons are stored. By definition, that's a problem for national security. And then the other problem, if my wife and I are walking down the street and see a saucer go by, big deal, happens all the time. He agreed with me. Uh, two separate communication channels. Mm. And so uh, that's extraordinary. And most people are totally unaware of Bolander's statement. All right. You brought up the, the New York Times. Yeah. You, you brought up the, you brought up the LEM, right? Lunar excursion module. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Um, a main argument of those who believe we never went to the moon is made that the astronauts in their suits could not fit into the limb. Have either one of you heard that? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I as in. That. Oh yeah. As in, you believe that, Jay? Well, I mean, I've I've I've, I've looked at the. Uh, uh, the limb that's at the Smithsonian, and what they what the the conspiracy theorists on that front are saying is that the with the backpack right. and the suit and right. everything they can't get through the small opening. That's right. And um, I I don't know if that's true or not. I, I'm um, I, I'm trying to imagine two astronauts putting on those suits inside the limb because they'd have to be all both have to be on before they open the hatch. Right. And um, I just, I, I've been inside and looked inside that. I can't imagine two six-foot men with backpacks um, <laughs> in that room. I mean, it, it's so small. It, I can't even hardly imagine one guy, yet let alone two. Yet they're telling us that they had two. There's another thing about the Apollo missions which needs to be brought up besides the Im improving production values and all that. And that is the fact that um, the that and Stan, you're going to appreciate this one. I know. Uh, I, I'm a, a former computer programmer. Besides being a filmmaker, I've always wanted to learn how to program computers. I learned COBOL and assembly and all this. And I know one I thing. I've learned a long time. <laughs> yeah, I know one thing about technical things. They never go right the first time. I don't care what anyone says. They never go right the first time. The only incident that I can ever think of where everything sailed perfectly the first time is Apollo 11. 
we had over 500,000 technical things that had to be done between launch and um, and, 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 the, and, the, and the set down in the ocean, and all of them functioned perfectly. They all functioned perfectly on Apollo 12. They functioned perfectly on 14, 15, 16, and 17. No glitches, nothing. The only glitch in the entire thing was Apollo 13. And I just don't buy it. I just don't buy it. I work with technology all day long. I know it is prone to every kind of glitch possible. So you're saying what? Uh, just too well, amazing? Wait too amazing? Wait, wait a minute. Okay. Too wait. amazing. Uh, too amazing. The That's first then. atomic bomb worked. Uh, that was very complicated, too. Never been done Not before. Not as complicated as not as complicated as getting launching uh, into yeah. Earth orbit, going from the Earth to the Moon, then going down from and never tested, taking a soft landing. The only soft landing test that was ever tried was by Neil Armstrong in, in, in New Mexico, and he almost killed himself. Uh, and, and yet, the next time they do the soft landing on a planet they've never been to, it goes absolutely perfect. Mm. It's unbelievable. I'm sorry, I, I just don't buy it. Not at all. Well, as I say, the atom the atom bomb worked. Uh, to, uh, admittedly, to some people's surprise. <laughs> you know? Well, it, you know, he is making a fair point. There's a lot more moving parts and things that yes. had, had to go right once they figured out the atomic bomb. It was probably physically simple compared to going to the moon, sitting down, walking around, getting back in, and coming home. Yeah, yeah. That, uh, the number uh, the of moon. technical issues that face you trying to just get to the moon and not miss by a, a 500 miles, um, it, it, it's astounding what you have to go through. And, uh, and they did it. They did it perfectly, absolutely perfectly. No glitches at all. And, and I, I can't buy it. Remember, there was a fire that killed three astronauts, too. Uh, in 1964, yeah, in 1964, there was a fire. And five years later, they, you know, they, they got to the moon. But... Um, even the fire itself is like you talk about stupid. They're, 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 they've got open electrical circuits inside a pure oxygen environment, and no one can figure out that this may not be a good idea. I mean, we're, that fire that killed those three astronauts is absolutely one of the most stupid things I've ever seen in my life. I cannot believe it's as stupid as taping over the tapes. And and, and yet say, you got guys, another one. <laughs> and and these are the guys that got us to the moon. And they, and they, I don't know. I don't see a whole lot of intelligence going on. We don't on. live in a perfect world, that's for sure. Uh, yeah. No, I, I, I think there are a number of remarkable things that we're talking about here. And I'm convinced we did go to the moon. And I've met several of the astronauts, and I'm convinced they weren't off on a soundstage someplace else. Because remember, it isn't enough to say that what the public was shown was fraudulent, but the astronauts had to be involved. Now, you're saying we don't know who was in the suits. No, we don't. Uh, so they, they well, even that means that it was a lie as well. I mean, uh, it's deeper than that, credit. Stanton. It's deeper than that. That's why I brought up the incidences with Edgar Mitchell and, and Buzz Aldrin. There's some kind of psychological operation going on where these guys, there's no way in the world that I'm going to go to the moon and not remember it, period. I don't care what you say. I'm going to remember every second. I'm going to relive those moments my entire life. And, 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 and neither Buzz Aldrin or Edgar Mitchell can even say it. They can't even talk about what happened to them on the moon. They just can't say it. Neil Armstrong never did an interview. He stayed on his ranch in Ohio and never went out, never did anything. Um, it's, um, it's over and over again you find these uh, odd reactions by the astronauts. And, um, I'm not, and again, I don't think they're lying. I don't think it's, I think it's much more complicated than that. Um, I think it's, I don't know. Brain, I don't know brain, uh, brain, brain washing, if you will. Well, I was, I, I was at a, um, a, a party with a bunch of NASA people and um, uh, this is in 94 in Cody, Wyoming. And if Richard Hogan's listening, he knows what I'm talking about. Got to be a quick story and, here. We're coming yeah, and, and I met the psychiatrist that debriefed the astronauts, and I was so happy to meet her. And I said, so what was the debriefing like? And she looked at me with this puzzled face, and she said, you know what? I can't really remember what they were like. 
<laughs> That's a great line. You know, th there is a lot of this. There is a lot of unusual behavior on the part of the astronauts. And then there's this clown running around holding Bibles up in front of them. Yep. I think uh, he's been clocked by astronauts yeah. a few Buzz times. Buzz Aldrin clocked him. Yeah, he knocked his clock Buzz, out. Yeah. Buzz did, yes. All right, you too. Buzz got quite a temper, so you don't want to... Hold, hold tight, you two. <laughs> we'll come back and we'll start to take questions from listeners, okay? Gentlemen, we're back on again. There is just one thing before we begin taking the calls that I want to ask about. And this goes to you, Jay. You think that NASA has found out something about our sun. Now, that's something that uh, I would think Stanton would be familiar with since he deals with things nuclear. It's nothing but a big nuclear fission reaction, I believe. So what fusion. Is it, fusion, I'm sorry. So what, what is it um, that we found out? Well, well, this is actually how I got started on my whole journey uh, years ago. I discovered a monument in the south of France, which I proceeded to uh, uh, decipher, which is actually in my first two books. And it appears to be of a 400-year-old monument in which a, I don't know, a secret society or some group of men um, has inscribed a series of symbols, which no doubt, after you see my interpretation, say that there was a gigantic CME or coronal mass ejection at some point in the past, which killed a lot of people. And they're warning about it in the future. And in fact, it's a, <clears throat> I believe it's, it's a group of Freemasons and that this may be one of the, the tenets of Freemasonry is to keep this memory of this outburst from the sun alive and also pass it down into the to the people of the future. And when a book for first book came out in 1999, I was actually criticized by NASA for being a fear monger. And uh, I actually got in some de debates with NASA. And then about 2004, all of a sudden NASA changed their mind and they began warning that there was this chance that we could be thrown into the sixth century BC, you know, in the flash of an instant by a coronal mass ejection frying everything up, which I had not really talked about. I was talking about the human part of it. Mm. And um, and so now NASA's in full tilt boogie about uh, coronal mass ejections and protecting nuclear power plants because if they get fried, the radiation is going to go crazy, And um, which I'm gratified to hear and see. But at the same time, um, I think it's really a, a really big concern that we should have, and we're not doing enough to protect ourselves from this. It's going to happen. It happened in 1859, and it's going to happen again. And we're a, a wired society, and we're going to pay deeply if, when, when this happens. And I think we should take care of it. All right. Here's somebody I think might agree with you from Cleveland, Ohio, something about Freemasons. Hello? Yes, our, hi. 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 Um, you know, I've heard various thoughts and conspiracy about uh, Freemason being involved with the Buzz Aldrin thing and the flag being brought to the moon. I wonder what your guests thought about that. Well, I don't know of any connection between Buzz and Freemasons. I've met Buzz, but uh, uh, I don't know whether there's a Freemason attribute or connection uh, at all. DJ? Well, actually, actually, yeah. Um, I, I, again, this is Buzz's words, not mine. Buzz uh, has admitted that he performed a Freemasonic operation when he was on the moon. Now, I don't believe he went to the moon, so I don't believe the story, but <laughs> why would he be performing a Freemasonic operation if he wasn't already a Freemason? Why is he saying this? Um, and I'm just telling you, this is widely reported. It's not some um, speculation or something. Yeah, I'm a Freemason, and um, I'm so thankful for you guys' thoughts on that. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much for the call. And uh, let's go to Jason on Skype. Hello. Hello, Art. Uh, so I had a question about uh, how the flags in the disturbance on the moon got there if we never landed there. Um, and the fact that several countries also tracked the Apollo missions via radar to the moon. So if we never went, how would they be able to track that? And um, India's probe, China's probe, and Japan's probe all spotted the uh, disturbance on the moon. So I, I never said we didn't go to the moon. I said that we didn't. What we were shown is fake. Right. So there's a big difference. All so right. I, uh, yeah. All right. Um, I don't think we're going to get a big argument um, on that. 
Uh, there should be an argument, though, about whether we went to the moon as you suggest we did, Jay, or whether we went to the moon as we were told we went to the moon. I mean, were we lied to, uh, Stanton? Do you think we were lied to about all that? I mean, about... Uh, the whole damn I, I thing. I don't think I, I, we got a different... Uh, no, I, I guess the simplest answer is no, okay? I don't think we went there in a fancy uh, electromagnetic <laughs> propulsion system uh, or, or an un, uh, unspoken about system. Right. Uh, uh, there, there are several different questions here. I do think we went there. I don't think the uh, astronauts worked on a soundstage somewhere to or... Well, okay, somebody impersonating astronauts, which makes it sound even worse, I guess. But it does, uh, uh, you know. So there's a whole gray area here, if you'll pardon the expression. <laughs> okay. That, well, speaking uh, of gray, Stanton, um, I'd like to point something out. I'm glad you brought that up. When the Chinese sent the rabbit, the jade rabbit, to the moon a year ago or whatever, they took pictures of the moon's surface. Uh, you agree that's probably true, right? But the surface of the moon is brown in those pictures, not slate gray like it is in all the Apollo photographs. And I haven't heard anybody explain why is there such a huge difference in the color of the moon between the two operations, especially when you consider that the astronauts were shooting ectochrome, which is far superior to digital. So um, I don't know. I'm glad to hear you say that last thing. I get people telling me we live in a digital world and everything's more advanced than it was before. And I say, hey, no. I used to use slides. They got better resolution than, than uh, Absolutely. Uh, my PowerPoint <laughs> does. <laughs> Film is so much better than digital. There's no way you can compare the two ever. All right. Very quickly, outside the country, Lee L. Hello. Hello. Lee L. Hi, or whatever your name is, you're on the air or you're not. Hello? Yes, hello. hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. So go ahead. Hi, 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 hi. Pleasure to speak to you. Uh, good to speak to you. Where are you? Hi. I'm actually in Coventry in the UK. Uh, it's actually my 40th birthday today, so it's really Happy good birthday. to get through to you guys. Okay. <laughs> okay, so um, how about if I play sort of devil's advocate with, with what uh, Richard C. Hoagland would probably say afterwards? Sure. And um, obviously we've got two problem problems here. We've got uh, a lot of the uh, um, the pictures and the video, they, they really look fake. And it's really difficult to say that uh, the whole moon landing could have been faked, you know, f from the whole operation with, with NASA and such. So how about um, when when they landed, um, there was there was some talk of a conversation that, that they saw things following them around and, um, you know, that, that it was cut at that point. And that was maybe where they cut to Stanley Kubrick's sort of, you know, pre-film, just in case something happened. Well, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. They, they pre-filmed it in the, in the 60s, mid-60s, um, and it was just, they pre-filmed it to ensure that if anything went wrong, they had this film. And, and, and then slowly, especially when I believe Nixon came in to the picture, he's like, I'm not, I've just become president. I, I'm one year into my presidency. I'm damn well not going to have this kind of disgrace happen in front of me if these guys die on camera and I have to get up and do their eulogy. I'm not going to have that. So you, you can't assure me that this is going to go 100%. So we'll just go with the film. And if it goes 100%, then we're fine. If it doesn't, then no one will ever know. And I, and, you know, this is the guy that did Watergate. And come on. <laughs> we got a, a double cosmic Watergate here. Huh? <laughs> all right. Thank you, caller. I appreciate it. Uh, all the way from Great Britain. Well, you know, if we're going to sit, if you two are going to sit here and agree that all this possibly could have been faked, then who's to say that some of the other things that people like Richard Hoagland have said about things that are on the moon, he believes, might not be true. Well, they are true. There's stuff all over the moon. And anybody who sits and examines the aerial photography of the moon, which is where Hoagland is right, when Hoagland is sticking with the lunar orbiter stuff, with the Apollo stuff from the air, wherever it was taken, with the stuff taken in orbit, that stuff is real. And what he's finding is, you know, it's jaw-dropping. There's domes, there's... Square-shaped buildings. There's looks like even highways in some cases. 
So, I mean, I don't know where it's from. I'm not going to speculate. Uh, you know, I think he's right. It's ancient. And it's been there for, you know, maybe millions of years. Stanton, are, right. you, are you ready to agree with that? Well, I'm, I'm ready to say that the, the lunar orbiters, uh, the, the recent ones, uh, have shown footprints on the moon implying that we had been there and somebody had been there. Somebody and was shoes. And so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, well, yeah. yeah well, again, <laughs> okay. I, I totally agree that people, we went to the moon, so I'm not going to argue that point. Okay. Yeah, but how we got there uh, is a big difference between you two. Yeah. Uh, I'm impressed with the Apollo, with the uh, Saturn V. Uh, it's a big old monster. <laughs> yes, it sure is. And, uh, do you know that they um, actually got rid of all the blueprints to the Saturn V and they don't, none exist at all to this day? <laughs> you know that? No, I yeah. didn't. No, I didn't know that. Yeah. I didn't you know, know it. The but lunar I... orbiter, Not all surprised. of the, the videotape of the lunar orbiters, uh, beautiful imagery of the moon, all that tape is rotting in a, 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 a McDonald's in Pasadena, California, an old McDonald's mm. closed down. It's just rotting in there. There's no air conditioning. This magnetic tape is all falling apart. NASA doesn't care about these images. It's a crime. I'm sorry. You're probably giving cans of it out to people ordering quarter pounders. Um, on, Skype, <laughs> on Skype, you're on the air with these two. Hello. Hello, Art and those two. Um, <laughs> uh, clarification, or actually a correction, the Apollo 1 fire was in January of 67 not 64. Okay, get good and you know close what? to the mic on your computer, please. Okay, uh, the other thing, now That's let me really understand it. We we landed on the moon, but what we saw on Earth was faked. Is that the premise? That's Jay's premise, yeah. yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, earlier, I think it was Jay who mentioned something about Kubrick uh, supposedly faking the footage. That's right. Uh, yeah. I sent you an email about a film called Room 237, which I'm explores that, and it's I'm on Netflix film. and Amazon if you want to check it out. Jay, you know about yeah. that? I'm the, I'm the star of the film, so yeah, I know all of yeah, it. I guess you do. Okay, well, check that out, Art. I think you'll be kind of fascinated yeah. by the questions that it raises and also the explanations that it offers. All right. Um, you know, so that's, a, that's, that's my point, three cents Art. worth for tonight. Yeah. All right, thank you. He's got a great point because we never touched on it, and I don't think we should on this show, but maybe some other show. But in 237, what they do is they cover all of these people's opinions of the movie The Shining. And my opinion of the movie The Shining, which I believe it, 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 it closes the case, is that every time that Fra uh, Stanley Kubrick deviates from the Stephen King book, he's telling you the story about him having to fake the Apollo moon landings. <laughs> and I have a – the case I make is deadly. And uh, even Christiana Kubrick wrote me and told me how impressed she was by my case. So wow. there you go. All right. Yeah. Um, what did Vivian say? Uh, 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 no, Christina, Vivian, Vivian, I don't know. Yeah. Vivian won't talk to me. And Vivian, um, uh, Vivian is a Scientologist living in Texas, and she won't talk to me. This is Stanley Kubrick's daughter, and she won't talk to me. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry, Johnny. Uh, I haven't talked to her either. <laughs> Johnny on the international Skype. You're on. Hello, Johnny. Johnny Webb. It says, "Are you there? Yes or no." Hello? Yes, I, can you hear me? Yes, I've got you now. Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, the question to your panel is, it's the uh, Van Allen radiation belt. Um, I understand, along with Gus Grissom, the Van Allen was killed in a car crash with his wife. Can they explain how today we still get through the Van Allen radiation belt? I don't think Van Allen was killed in a car crash. Was he, Stanton? I don't think I, I don't think I, I, I don't that. know, but... Uh, again, the, the radiation levels, as long as you don't stay in the wrong place for too long, uh, yeah. unshielded, et cetera, et cetera, uh, are not deadly. Uh, in other words, it's something you have to take into account. It's something, but, you know, I've worked around radiation for a lot of years, and you can tolerate a good amount of it. Uh, you Look, you sleep in the same bed with somebody for a year, you get a measurable dose of radiation from them. Uh, well, not they use suits in, in, in Fukushima, for instance. Why are these spacesuits so good for the Van Allen, but not for Fukushima? Entirely different situation. The kind of radiation, the energy levels of the radiation, and the duration of uh, staying there, uh, living there, I was going to say. But uh, Fukushima, it's, it's an entirely different kind of situation. 
uh, high energy gamma rays from uh, nuclear fuel. Uh, that was a mess. No question. Well, even then, it, even then at Fukushima, there's a farmer that only lives two miles away. He's still there because he wanted to take, take care of his animals, and the animals are all still alive, and he's still alive. Um, just saying, you know, he's only two, two miles right. away. Right, it's not so. totally deadly because there's an accident and a large release of radiation. Doesn't mean totally everybody agreement. kills over. This is not Hiroshima or Nagasaki. An entirely different situation. All right, I, you I agree with you on the Van Allen belts, and I don't usually ever use it in any arguments that I make. So. <laughs> Good. Okay. All right, you two. Hold tight. Uh, we're at a break point. All right. Uh, back to our um, our two distinguished guests. And I must say, you've both done a very, very good job this night. Um, I've got a call for you from, I think, all the way on the other side of the world in Bangkok. Hello. Wow. Hello. Hello, this is Charlie in Bangkok, and I've got a delay on one of the signals. That's quite all right, Charlie. Uh, Proceed. I'm with you. Real quickly, uh, two comments. Uh, Gus Grissom, the lemon man, was murdered. And two things that Art knows about, many things Art knows that he's smarter than his guests. A lot of the time. No, I'm not. He keeps asking, why do the astronauts who went to the moon <laughs> keep saying they have no memories? Last thing, question. Uh, are you two gentlemen exasperated with people who will not just build a door the same size as the ship, <laughs> put on the suit, and try to get through it? All right, one at a time. You want to answer? Yeah, well, I've actually asked myself that question. The problem is, is that you can't find a suit. I mean, there's one at the Smithsonian, but they won't let you use it, so you can't do a proper measurement on it. And uh, you know, the, 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 it's just—it's amazing. You can't. All these suits have just disappeared. Uh, you can't find any of them. Just like the blueprints to Saturn V, you can't find them. They're—they're they're gone. So, this is very frustrating. I must admit, Stanton. Well, I, I feel the same frustration. My first thought is I want to talk to a bunch of astronauts, and they're going by the wayside, too. Uh, and, you know, where do you get a straight answer? And I, I, it, it's hard to tell. Uh, guys can do all kinds of strange things. There's some very crowded airplanes where, where you say, how the heck did the pilot get in there? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, single-seater kind of things. And uh, I don't know. Uh, people will work hard to get certain things done. And what we are dealing with here also is a failure of NASA to look at things from the public's viewpoint. Uh, I've felt that NASA has lacked leadership for a very long time. Uh, what they needed was an Admiral Rickover, the nuclear submarine, nuclear aircraft carrier, et cetera, who said, that's where we're going, folks. You don't want to go there? Get off the ship. <laughs> you know, Richard's uh, coming up next, and I can see him smiling right now. I would like to address that, actually, what he just brought up. Go ahead. Um, James, James Oberg was incensed by the 19, or 2004 documentary on Fox called We Never Went to the Moon. He was totally incensed. You know, I think you guys know who James Oberg is. He's a science writer, really good science yes, writer. Yes, yes, And um, huge man, too, by the way, like six foot eight. But um, yes. he... Uh, <laughs> He uh, um, he, demand, he went to NASA and he got a twenty-five thousand uh, dollar advance to write a book proving that they went to the moon. He became exasperated because he kept asking NASA for this file and that file and this picture and that picture and this video and that video, and they would never help him. Finally, he returned the advance and gave up writing the book, not because he didn't want to write the book, but because NASA wouldn't cooperate with him. <laughs> Stan Think about that. Stan I'm not. I'm not surprised. Uh, as I say, I, I have. I worked on the space program, and everybody I worked with thought we'd have a base on the moon before the end of the last century. Boy, no kidding. And it sure as heck hasn't happened. And so uh, that's what I mean by leadership uh, guts, if you want to put it that way. All right. Well, Jacob. Uh, oh, hold on, guys. We're in calls. Jacob uh, on Skype. You're on the air. Good evening. I had a question for Jay. Um, if you believe that we had been to the moon, but what we were shown on video was not in fact what happened, then what would have happened with all the astronauts who actually went up there? Were they the same people, but under different circumstances? Or did they just kind of disappear out of history and never get heard from again? 
you know, I, I'm not, I don't know. I'm not really much of a speculator, but um, I, all I have to do is look at that press conference on YouTube with uh, Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong and Michael Collins to know I can read body language. I'm a former investigative journalist. Also, I can tell when somebody's lying. And these guys, these guys look like their dog just died. I mean, I mean, they don't, they don't look happy or elated or success, feel like they look successful. They look like they look like they're kind of ashamed. And watch it and make up your own mind. Don't let me influence <laughs> you. you know? All right. Uh, Columbus, Ohio, you're on the air. Hi, Art. Uh, awesome show and finding it wildly entertaining. Uh, the two things I called about, uh, one, you guys keep calling the alternative propulsion electromagnetic. It's actually electrogravitic. Yes, it is. Okay. Well, it, there's even argument about whether it exists, so whatever we yes. call it. If you go read any of uh, Townsend Brown's work, uh, it's yep. all children's toys, basically. I mean, I, we've so yep. much as they kept. But uh, I'm a professional photographer, and my question, um, I saw a while back they sold one of the Hasselblads they claim went to the moon, and there was no shielding on that camera whatsoever. And, you know, if you shoot a lot of film, you know that radiation obviously is a problem because the airports and x-rays, but heat also plays a big role, and unfiltered sun on a camera like that full of film would just nuke it. So did they have any kind of, I mean, I haven't seen any, but... Did they shield those cameras in any way when they took them up there? No way. No, if you go to the Hasselblad site, Hasselblad provided the cameras. They actually show you the, the cameras. They're just regular Hasselblads, and unshielded. And um, and you're right. Uh, uh, unshielded cameras uh, in 250 degree heat. It's, it's actually that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard as a photographer. I know there's no way that this can happen. But you bring up another point, which I, I really want to talk about, which I haven't yet, and that is the composition of the photography in, on the moon. Now the astronauts had the camera on their chest. They could not look through the viewfinder. They were just clicking away, clicking away. But if you look, and I have, and I've been to Houston, I've gone through the entire photo archives of NASA's Apollo missions, and you look, and it's one stunning photograph after another. It's just, you know, and then you think about, oh, Stanley Kubrick got hired by Look Magazine to be their top photographer when he was 19 years old. Um, and you look at these photographs, and there's no way. This is, these are amateur shots by guys who aren't looking through the lens. These are carefully composed and lit shots. And um, as a photographer, they're just very well done. That's all I can say. Well, I always wondered who set up the cameras to, you know, initially, to, you know, to show them getting out and, to, you know, the thing, tilted, you know, to watch them go away. I always kind of wondered how they did that stuff. But, uh, like, even now, you know, there's a... Well, there's a you're bringing up a great point because the, there's a four-second delay between the video camera on the moon and Houston uh, because of the miles between. And yet when the rocket takes off, the camera follows it perfectly. All right. With on that note. Delay, you would notice that the kind of the patent would go dark. And I'm contending to you that every time one of these inventions comes up, it, it makes a brief flurry in the news, and then it goes dark. Everything seems to be happening like this, and I'm contending to you that they're that that's exactly what's going on. They're going dark, and they're they're, they're contributing to this overall mission of creating this kind of breakaway civilization, as Richard Dolan puts it, where they're 60, 70 years ahead of us, and that means a lot. Think about technology 70 years ago and now, and you can you know there was mm. no transistors, no computers, and 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 so if they are that far ahead. And the reports I get from my insiders are is that this is the correct view, that they are that far ahead and that they're really advanced and they have all sorts of incredible gizmos, that, uh, including a, a box the size of a shoebox that apparently can uh, create uh, energy out of nothing and, and run, you know, huge machines. And, uh, and, and they have all free energy and they have all these things and they're hiding it. And... Um, uh, I think it's time for this stuff to be released. I think the Earth, we don't need any more Fukushimas. We don't need any more um, oil burning. Um, we can, if, if they really have this technology, I think we have to really start kind of forcing the issue. And that's one of the reasons I'm doing this whole thing about the moon and Stanley Kubrick is I'm trying to get these issues forced out into the open because my insiders tell me they have amazing technologies. All right, we're supposed to be at the phones. Kokomo, Indiana, hello. Hi, it's Steve in Indiana. Yes, and uh, Art, it's a pleasure talking to you. And uh, Mr. Mr. Friedman, I've followed your career for years, 
and um, I, I, I'm, I'm entitled to agree with you. And uh, the reason I say that is um, how would you explain if we had such advanced technology at the time and we were using it, how would you explain the Apollo 13 that Tom Hanks brought to uh, light? <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Uh, what do I have to explain? You got some smart yeah. astronauts doing clever things. Okay, I didn't say that wasn't real. <laughs> I, I didn't either. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> All right, there you go. Green again. Uh, let's see. Let Let's go to Tim on Skype. Hello, Tim. Hey, how's it going? It's going okay. Awesome. Good to talk to you. All right. Um, Unless you're at uh, NASA, they're probably ticked. <laughs> an asset. Yeah, I, I am an asset. Yes. <laughs> so? Okay, so this question is for Jay. Um, Jay, I know you're a filmmaker, and I'm aware of uh, your stance in the world, which is amazing. We need that, actually. People need to hear what Jay has to say. He's got a lot of great things to say, and it's not just him. It's it's, it's information that's on this planet that he has in him, and many people have in them, but they're keeping quiet. Okay, do you have I a mean, question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where, how, how do we see your new film, Jay? The Last Avatar. Oh, The Last Avatar, yeah. Last yeah. Avatar opened yesterday on Vimeo, and um, you just go to thelastavatar.movie.com, or if you want to watch it, you know, you just watch thelastavatarmovie.com. Okay, it is a story of what? Uh, it's a story of a guy who is pretty much a failure in life who realizes that he's actually a dynamic, special human being that, and, and he tries to change the world, which is what I think all of us should be trying to do right now because the world's in pretty bad shape. That it is. Yep. All right. Uh, it's a good movie. I, hope, I think people would like it. I think you'd like it, Art. I'll right. send you a free uh, link, and you can watch it in your spare time. All right. <laughs> Mo Montreal, Quebec, you're on the air. Yes, hello. Uh, I'm looking at a Freemasonry page uh, for British Columbia and Yukon, and they've got uh, Buzz Aldrin belonging to the Clear Lake Lodge in Seabrook, Texas. And they also have the... Uh, Gris, uh, Grissom, who died in 67, as uh, belonging to the Mitchell Lodge of uh, Indiana, Mitchell, Indiana. I and and what does that answer. mean? What do you think that means? They, they, they were all Freemasons, uh, uh, Art. Um, just like all the people that worked on um, uh, Trinity were Freemasons. Okay, no, my question was, what does that mean? Well, it means that you'll keep a secret. That's that's really what it means. You take an oath as a Freemason to protect your brothers, and uh, if you make everybody on the project a Freemason, then everybody has to be quiet. Then you keep the secret. Oath. Okay. Yeah, that's well how they do it. Stanton, you have any argument with any of that? Well, uh, there have been people keeping secrets for a very long time. Uh, look, I don't know if you've had anybody on from NSA, but... Uh, they have released 156 top secret Umbra UFO documents, <laughs> the problem pages of documents. The only trouble is you can only read one sentence per page. It hasn't yeah. had any impact anywhere. Are they lying to us? I mean, are they keeping secrets from us? No question about it. So it's not just Freemasons who keep secrets. It's uh, <laughs> NSA types and CIA types, uh, blacked out documents. Uh, where you can read three words a page, you know, mm. uh, and the Amen media ignores it. Redacted. All right, here's somebody yeah. on Skype. Uh, it says truth up there. Let's see what he's got. Good morning, Art, uh, to your guests as well. Roswell's from Virginia. Thank you. Michael. All right, uh, this has been an interesting, if disjointed, program. I'm not entirely sure what Mr. Widener is getting at. So far as I can tell, he claims that NASA did in fact go to the moon, but the footage we were all shown was a fakery produced by, I guess, Stanley Kubrick. Yeah, you correct? got it. That's right. Okay. All right. So I got that covered. What I'm struggling to understand then is for what purpose did NASA produce this cover-up? What was it they were trying to hide? Uh, thanks, Art. Shout out to Belgab, and I'll take the answer off the air. Oh, you go, Key. 
Uh, they were trying to hide many things. One, they were trying to hide their real technology, I believe, from anybody and everybody. Two, they didn't want to, they, they, it, was, it was too chancy to take the photographs on the ground where they may actually get alien artifacts, which are all over the place up there. And um, three, they wanted to make sure that, um, you know, the news was always good and it was never bad. And so they wanted to make, they faked it also to make sure that everybody in the space program looked good. And believe me, they do those kinds of things. Also, um, Edgar Mitchell told uh, James Fox, a filmmaker, who's a friend of mine, he confronted uh, Edgar, he's a friend with Edgar, and he said, hey, Edgar, do you think there's any possibility that, you know, some of the stuff was faked like Widener is saying? And Edgar said, with a twinkle in his eye, I quote, um, he said, oh, uh, you know, we might have faked a few things. Oh, did he really say that? Yeah, that's do what you, he was told me. Do you have, Fox told me. I don't suppose you have that on tape. No, but he'll say it. I bet he'll. James Fox will say it. I mean, he said it was just matter of factly to him. So, we uh, might have faked a few things. Yep, with a twinkle in his eye. Twinkle. <laughs> Fort Smith, Arkansas. You're on here. Hello. Uh, yes, this is uh, Mike from uh, Fort Smith. Right. Um, a couple. Th a couple things here. Uh, I just want to make a comment about the uh, about the moon. Why isn't that uh, none of these other nations have landed uh, any of their astronauts or cosmonauts on the moon? And then I've got a short story here of a uh, of something I've seen in uh, 2011. Okay, well, I'm sorry. I, I don't have time for the short story, but I do have time for the question, and it's a good one. Why, yeah, it is a good one. Yeah, why haven't some of the other technologically advanced and advancing nations, we have many of those right now, uh, landed somebody on the moon, or will they? Well, um, China expects to. I know, yeah. China's working at it. It's difficult. And India, I'm too, I think. And Japan. Uh, oh, probably, but again, it's very difficult. The radiation problems, uh, uh, the solar radiation, the uh, synchrotron radiation, uh, there's a lot of problems being on the surface of the moon that no one is actually talking about. NASA has put out many papers recently warning about how dangerous it is out in outer space and on the moon and, and going to Mars without actually ever considering that they actually went there and everybody was fine. So there's a a great contradiction within NASA about the whole thing. Okay. Let's go to Ken uh, on Skype. Ken, hello. Hi, Jimmy. Hi, uh, Stan. Uh, I talked to you the last caller last night. I hope I'm not the last caller tonight. I'm a retired aerospace engineer. I've, uh, I'm also a Mason. And uh, Well, then you obviously certified... can't talk to us, right? Yeah, I can. Uh, and I'm also certified <laughs> metallurgy and aluminum non-ferrous alloys and optical emission spectroscopy. What I wanted to tell you is uh, there's a connection. You mentioned about the 400-year CME warning that was on, Jay. Yeah. And I've come up with a premise, I think, that is really shocking. It's about the, the vial vortices. There's 12 of them on this earth. And they're made up of aluminum alloy that is isotope 26. And they're placed around the globe at north and south hemispheres in an even pattern, almost like a stator on a motor. And I've been trying to correlate that with what we're seeing with the sun CME, the, um, the noises in the atmosphere and the grinding noises that Linda was talking about last week. Yeah. Um, and I don't, get, I don't get it. Everybody's talking about the sun. The sun is now going quiet. We're coming out of the sun cycle. You have to look really hard to see any sunspots at all, much less major eruptions. But what well, do I know? the point is, what we're looking at here with this reduction of magnetic fields of the Earth is a potential for a magnetic flip, and I think yep. that oh, yes. those valve vortices were placed there intentionally. Okay, and it had to be created from a high intensity gamma proton ray beam directed from space to coordinate that kind of pattern. So I believe that there was a civilization here before and maybe still here that we're dealing with the secret uh, societies that we're talking about that are really directing humanity and they may have actually placed them there to prevent 
a poll flip. And I'd like to get some comments, Mr. Freedom, Freeman, from you on that. Okay, for a, a, uh, about a poll flip. I'm sure he's about to be killed for what he just said, but go ahead. Uh, I worry about things like that, like CMEs and so forth, and also the fact that we've had a planet here for over 4 billion years, and our recorded history is really very short, and I don't see that we're any smarter than the Greeks were. We know some things they didn't know, but no more intelligent Greek literature is not children's literature, for example. So I think we are living in a world in which we are quite ignorant about the past, and I think there may very well have been advanced civilizations here. Now, we may be somebody's colony, too. It's a penal colony. They dumped all the bad boys and girls here, and that's why we're so nasty to each other. Uh, I, don't, I can't find another good reason for us to be so nasty. So I think we've got a lot to learn. And, you know, many of the things that we accept today were rejected for a long time, not because they were wrong, but because people thought, well, I'm so smart. If that were true, I would know about it, and I don't. Uh, Kathleen Martin and I did a book on Science Was Wrong, 14 chapters, each one stimulated by some smart guy saying something stupid. <laughs> like, man will never fly, said a great astronomer. That was uh, two months before the Wright Brothers' first flight. The English astronomer Royal said space travel is utter bilge uh, a year before Sputnik. Uh, sp uh, the uh, vaccination would never do anything about smallpox. You know, uh, there are a whole bunch of these. The original title was supposed to be, uh, it's impossible, isn't it? <laughs> well, tonight's show has been more like man didn't fly. <laughs> well, not really, because I'm, I'm saying that they did. I know. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Um, it's just, I, I don't know, it's very frustrating because you two have agreed at least to the point that I'm a little depressed <laughs> not depressed really that you sorry, agree Depre depressed what it means with what it means you know it, it means it means they lie to us well they do lie wouldn't to be us. the first time yeah. Yeah, it hey look at the there. Air Force report on Roswell yeah. uh, hey all the way up to Tell Tell me, Snowden none of which were launched until six years after Roswell but they put a big fat report saying that explains the talk about bodies associated with Roswell. And they got away with it in the New York Times, too. <laughs> Stanton, you two, I've got to go. Uh, thank you both very much. The show just ended way, way, way before I wanted it to. Stanton, I'll have you back. Uh, Jay Widener, I'll definitely have you back, too. So thank you both, and good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. So that's the end of the uh, Great Lunar Debate with Art Bell and Stanton Friedman. Uh, it was a trip, i got to tell you, to be on, st uh, on uh, live radio with these two heavyweights and, uh, and standing up for myself uh, in, you know, what a lot of people think is a rather ridiculous theory, you know, that Stanley Kubrick did the moon landings. I wish I'd gotten to talk about The Shining a little more because that's really the, you know, that's the, uh, that's the major thing that you could say about, about uh, Stanley Kubrick's work. He actually confesses to doing the moon landings in The Shining. But I didn't get to say much about it, but I did get to uh, plug Room 237, uh, which is on Netflix. If you guys are sitting at home and you don't have anything to do, um, go watch it. Uh, I'm kind of the star of the show, and um, Rodney Asher, the director, really treated me very well, I have to say, in that movie. So uh, thanks for watching. Subscribe. Please tell your friends. Hit like, and uh, I'll be back.